everyone. This episode is brought to you by our friends at PureCraft Renovations. Your home renovations need to work for your family and to be done right. You can find out about them at their website at purecraft.ca. A big thanks to them for sponsoring the show and making this conversation possible. Now, on to the episode. Hey everybody, welcome to Real Talk. Uh, we are here this fine Saturday morning with a couple of gentlemen who have agreed to uh, come on the podcast and share their points of view. Uh, we're excited to talk to them and and hopefully uh, this could be a, a great conversation, one that promotes unity and understanding and um, yeah, just just have a genuine conversation. So the two guests today are uh, MPP Sam Ostroff, MPP Will Balma. So we've talked about COVID uh, a number of times on this podcast and we've had some people who I've had opinions which would uh, which would disagree somewhat and differ from these two gentlemen. So we're, uh, you know, Will's laughing at that, uh, that <laughs> understatement of the century. But uh, yeah, we're hoping this, I mean, this was the goal since the beginning with this podcast is to create a platform where we can have, uh, you know, genuine discussions. And uh, yeah, these are real issues. They affect real people and there's real differences. So today we'll be, uh, we'll be discussing all that. So I guess I'll throw it over. To, we'll start with Sam, we'll go to Will, just give a brief introduction, who you are, what you do, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for uh, having us. Uh, yeah, my name is Sam Osterhoff. I'm the MPP for Niagara West. Um, I live in the area in Niagara West. It's sort of two thirds of the geography of the Niagara region, but only about just shy of 20% of the population. So people don't realize that it's a huge geographical area, but not that uh, not that populated. Uh, I was elected in uh, 2016, November of 2016, for the riding of Niagara West Glanbrook at the time. Um, so I've been uh, blessed to serve the people of Niagara West for five years now and uh, been able to also work alongside the Minister of Education as a parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Education um, since we came to government in 2018. Uh, I have a beautiful wife, Carrie, and an uh, awesome little guy, uh, Sullivan, who was born last year. So uh, yeah, just really thankful to be here and have the opportunity to chat a little bit about, yeah, well, different points of view about obviously COVID, but also uh, government role and legitimacy of government roles uh, within dealing with this health crisis that we've gone through for the last couple of years, which has obviously had a lot of impacts on on people's lives. And we recognize that and want to speak a little bit about um, what we hear and the, the, the positions that obviously people have differing perspectives on. Wonderful. Thanks. And Will. Well, Number one, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here with you guys. I know Sam mentioned, I don't know how long it was ago that you guys started. So I've been listening to all the podcasts since the beginning. Oh, wow. I really appreciate wow. the work that you're doing and the fact that we have local people that are trying to bring that view to it. I always think it's too long, but yeah. <laughs> the hour and a half goes by really, really quick. But uh, I'm a small town optometrist, uh, born in the Netherlands. My family immigrated in 1976 to a dairy farm which my family's been doing for half a millennium or so. And uh, my little brother's on the farm there now. Uh, went to Waterloo for four years, and then I ended up in Grand Rapids for optometry school. And uh, we felt called to uh, obey the command to honor our parents, so we moved back this way in 2006, set up a private practice in the little village of St. George in the county of Brant. And, um, and then once you get wrapped up in a community that way, it's hard to say no found myself on county council after a bunch of other things, you know, typical school board ed committee at the school church synod synodical committees. I go to the free reform church and, uh, and then uh, I was asked to run for provincial politics and, uh, it's been an interesting education, but also quite an opportunity. And, and I, I value the fact, uh, that I've had trailblazers like Sam going before me. Cause even though he's old enough to be my son, uh, <laughs> or I'll, be, I'll be 50 and, in uh in uh july um i really really have a lot of respect for uh the ability that he's been able to bring forward a um wise um biblical reformed worldview and give that kind of exposure to the people that we see um, in toronto because i think probably the two biggest things that have happened to me over the last four years is number one I realized that whether you um, woke up in a beautiful home in the country uh, <laughs> that's worth millions of dollars and drive a nice car or whether millions of dollars in today's um, housing market or whether you woke up in the gutter in downtown Brantford strung out on fentanyl, you're one of mine and I have a responsibility to you. Uh, the other thing is that for many people that we meet in Toronto and, and Sam can attest to that too is, you know, we're probably 
for many, as close as they will ever get to meeting Jesus. And someday they will have to get an account to him for who they were and what they did in this life. And if their only memory from this life is the Christ that they saw in me, that uh, that's really affected me deeply because I have to tell you, and Sam will attest to that, I am really, really good at being a jerk in the house and <laughs> all those things and and uh, talking back and forth and especially starting out on the opposition side and the rump between the opposition and the independent liberals. But I've just been struck by that. Now, I'm a sinner saved by grace, so I know I mess that up every single day. And yet what drives me more now is the fact that how do I get as many people as possible through this and what am I showing to the world? And uh, those are my driving principles on this and, uh, and in this role. And then the other thing is to be able to be completely comfortable in the fact that um, as long as God wants me here, I'm invincible. Mm. And the minute he doesn't want me here anymore, I can't win. And to winning or losing, um, and as hard as we're going to work in order to win again, it's really, really great to believe in a sovereign God and to recognize that he holds all those things in his hands and that um, all we have to do is go with it and uh, to honor him in the work that we do. And, and I, think, I think we can both say that, well, I, don't, I know me, I, I, I struggle all the time, but, but to be able to look at my brother uh, from this, this area and to know that we are holding fast to our confession and comporting ourselves with distinct honor uh, to God um, is, is, uh, my, my, it, it's, it, it's nice to know once in a while you get that feeling. Yes, this is exactly where God wants me to be. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably more convinced of that than ever, even through the difficulties that we have gone through over the last couple of years. I'll stop there. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. They're good at talking, eh? They do that, yeah, they do they that do more do often. Than that. Well, we talk a lot for no, but not for a living. <laughs> no, just for, just for passion. But. Okay, so I think I think a good place to start would be to get both of your perspectives on. Let's go with let's go with the most controversial issue, and maybe we can work back before COVID. But sure, let's start with the last two years. Um, yeah, because I, I I feel like that's I don't think that's unfair to say that's a large reason why you're here is to discuss COVID and. Mm -hmm. And how that has proceeded and the role you know the government has played in uh, in all of our lives over the last two years has been uh, larger than we're uh, typically accustomed to well so, are you up first sam or am i up first I can... it's, it's up to you guys whoever feels more uh more yeah to the ball. <laughs> I, i'm happy to speak a little bit about um sort of the perspective that that uh i have when it comes to the the response around COVID. so we all acknowledge uh that COVID is real, that COVID has an impact. Um, we know, of course, that it's disproportionate for uh, those at higher risk. We know that there's uh, differing ways of approaching fighting COVID and, and, and different jurisdictions have taken different approaches and we, we recognize that. So um, I, I want to be careful that I'm not saying, you know, everything that's ever been done in the province of Ontario by the government of Ontario is right, or uh, we've never made mistakes. Uh, I think anywhere you find uh, government. I think, I think we both have to say, Sam, that Ronald Reagan was bang on that the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. It's actually one of my taglines. I'm here to help. So thank you very much there, uh, Will. I want to change that one there. <laughs> no, so, so, so I, I want to just provide that that sort of caveat because I recognize that um, governments everywhere, whether you know, we're made up of of simple people, and we're gonna make wrong decisions, and and I think that's why we also confess, you know, um, in our confession around uh, respecting those in authority over us, that we say have patience with their weaknesses and shortcomings, right? Mm -hmm. But with that in mind, one of the ways that I've seen the approach to government engagement around uh, preventing death and serious illness as a result of COVID is that we confess. Um, you know, in the sixth commandment in the Heidelberg Catechism, one of our one of our confessions, we confess that in the sixth commandment, which is thou shalt not murder, um, we say that I am not to dishonor, hate, injure, or kill my neighbor. Moreover, I am not to harm or recklessly endanger myself. Therefore, also the government bears the sword to prevent murder. So those two are are quite connected. Um, not recklessly endangering ourselves or harming ourselves and the government being 
uh, one of the ones who bears the sword or you know, the means of force or uh, the, the laws of the land to prevent murder. And then farther on, it says that the next question and answer is, is it then not enough that we do not kill our neighbor in any such way? And the answer, of course, is no. When God condemns envy, hatred, and anger, he commands us to love our neighbor. And then it also says, he also commands us to protect him from harm as much as we can. And to do good even to our enemies. And so understanding from a reformed perspective that the government bears the sword to prevent murder. I'm not to harm and recklessly endanger myself. And we must protect our neighbor from harm as much as we can. We look at the actions that have been taken over the past couple of years with the express intent to protect, to save human life, to reflect the fact that there are vulnerable populations who are more susceptible to COVID, uh, that there are complications that arise also as a result of um, the impacts of filled hospitals in, in our situation um, that impact other people who are waiting for care, who are waiting for delayed surgeries. And from my perspective, being um, a Christian involved in the political life, we recognize that we're not libertarians, right? Uh, we don't confess that um, anarcho-capitalism is the way that uh, we're going to have virtuous lives. We recognize that that the government has been given um, authority to help protect life. That's why we acknowledge there are a lot of areas, uh, you know, whether it's seatbelt laws, that's kind of the common one people talk about, but there's a lot of areas that like think about workplace legislation, right? You have to wear a harness if you're on a roof. Um, if we wanted to take the extreme and say, uh, well, that's not the role of the state. We don't believe that the state has any authority to tell me to wear a harness uh, or to tell me to wear a, a, a seatbelt. Um, I respect that, but I disagree. I don't think from a reformed perspective we can hold to that because we confess that the government also bears the sword to prevent murder, which we define murder as also being recklessly endangering ourselves or causing harm to our neighbor. In that context, then, um, I feel that over the past two years, the actions that the government has taken, whether those were you know, restrictions, uh, whether those were temporary measures such as things like masking, which as we're, we all know, and I'm sure we're all excited for our dropping uh, very shortly. Um, these are extraordinary measures that obviously bore costs, and we recognize that there are costs associated with that. I think the number one cost that I see is, is social division between uh, families, between communities. I mean, we saw that obviously um, with some of the protests that have happened. So there are costs associated with that, but then the balance to that becomes are those costs greater than the benefit? As a pro-life person, as a pro-life Christian, when we look at what the data says, and I believe it's important to look at that data because we confess we're also people of truth. We're people of life, right? Um, serving a God of life, but we're also people of the truth, serving the God of truth. And when we look at what happened in other jurisdictions, um, you know, the ones I often hear about from people are, oh, well, look at Florida, look at Texas. They're doing so great. Well, Let's look at those data, right? Um, they had a excess death rate of 26% in Florida last or in, in Texas last year. Uh, in Florida, that was 21%. Uh, in Canada, it was 5.2%. Uh, what that means is, you know, the expected death rate went up at a certain percentage. In Florida, it went up 26% higher than what it would have been anticipated. Um, if you look at the per capita deaths, uh, Ontario is had less than a third of the amount of per capita deaths than many of those jurisdictions. And when we look at the country as a whole and we say, okay, um, but there's a lot of other things that happen as a result of that. We think of negative consequences, right? How do you weigh those out? <clears throat> it's true, but a lot of that can be seen very isolated. So the common argument I'll get from people is that the, there's harms to suicide or opioid or you know um, bankrupt businesses. But again, um, when you actually go back to the data, uh, suicides are down 32% in uh, Canada year over year. Um, opioids are up. You know, we have substantial increase in opioids. Um, but we also know that in Florida, they're up 56%. Mm -hmm. So sure, opioid deaths are up here, um, but they're also up there where they didn't have some of the lockdowns that we did. And then the number that I look at when it comes to overall health and all of it, and it kind of catches it all in a basket, is life expectancy, right? The last time Canada saw a life expectancy decrease, I believe, was the Second World War. We saw our life expectancy decrease by 0.4, just under half of the year. 
um, the average Canadian life expectancy dropped by about half a year last year. The U.S. life expectancy dropped by 1.6, right? So a year and a half. Their life expectancy on average dropped by a year and a half. And I'm not saying that again to say that we've done everything right mm -hmm. or that the U.S. has done everything wrong. And obviously there's a lot of variance between states and between provinces and the approaches and, and lots of catches and falls. Mm -hmm. um, but that's data that I think we need to remember as pro-life people, uh, as people of the truth, that it's easy to say, well, those places didn't have measures and everything turned out great. But the reality is that that's not what happened. And the measures that were put in place here, um, and you can speak a little bit more as having served as the parliamentary assistant to the, to the premier about his heart for, for life mm -hmm. and his desire to see lives saved. Um, but I believe that that's, that's something we can hold to as reformed Christians saying, we confess that the government has a role in bearing the sword. Did this help? prevent deaths that would have otherwise happened? I believe yes. And then from there, you know, we can have conversations about what those lines look like, but that's my approach. Okay. You got somewhere you want to go with that? Oh, I have a few we'll, questions, let, but we'll I'll, I'll, I'll let Will go and then we'll, we'll circle back to it. No, it sounds good. Um, thank you, Sam. You, uh, you always have a better handle on the technical <laughs> details of those things, but He's got like six reams of paper. Yeah, yeah, and I got wheels flying off my couple of stuff. <laughs> but um, for me, in my roles, and and I've done that both in the premier's office when I was his parliamentary assistant for two years, and in the Ministry of Finance now, where I've been now for almost a year. Um, I like to boil, try to in my mind to boil things down to its essence, because when you do that, and you find a simple lens that you can look at problems through. Um, it informs your decisions moving forward because then you can keep going back to this idea. Why are we doing this? What's the best way to move forward? And so I, I've done that with COVID too. And especially with a lot of the flack that we've been getting is I, I've boiled it now down to is COVID response a salvation issue? And um, I don't know, I can ask you, but I think the answer is simply no. Okay. so. That means that 10,000 years from now, what we decided to do with COVID won't matter. What does matter is our personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So if COVID response then is not a salvation issue, I should not break fellowship or get angry with someone based on what they think we should or should not do with COVID response, which I need actually. And because a lot of times when I get upset with someone, I have to bring myself back to this doesn't matter. Not in that sense. Does it matter on the ground and the decision? Yeah, absolutely. But this doesn't matter eternally. Therefore, let it go. And that really helps out because, you know, my joke is I like to go to church every Sunday with a 20 gallon pail of grace. <laughs> and my goal is to walk out of church with that pail still spilling over. And that's really hard sometimes. And especially, you know, just I did the crazy thing last week of walking back into my sanctuary with a mask on and no one else was, and we were sitting shoulder to shoulder. And I reasoned through in my head how I could do that with a good conscience. But, so that's my foundational thing. So, but what are the implications of the decisions that we make through then with COVID? And if you imagine life and liberty in a balance, both are good and we love them. But now we're in a pandemic situation and you can't have both of those to the degree that you would like. You can't. And, and, you know, Sam has the evidence and I absolutely agree with that. Like I've been following Michigan closely because we lived there for a year, uh, for, I lived there for 11 years and, you know, they have four times the death rate that we do. They have 10 million people. We have 15 million people. If you do the quick math of the reported deaths, you know, they're well over 50,000 people. We're at 12. Okay. Using the same mechanisms and you can argue about the mechanisms, but the reality is I think those errors would carry through everywhere. And so those are two different responses. Uh, someone brought up California where they did a lot of restrictions. They're significantly less. They're still at 33,000 if they were Ontario. Um, but regardless, so there's different responses. If we take the liberty side, this is most important. That's not wrong. I don't think you're a bad person if you value liberty over life. Fine. But that means we have to give up some lives and leave those lives in God's hands. If you take the life side, okay, and I got to, into this with the premier last summer. We had a very long conversation about this. 
And where we end, because when we went down this road of segregation, I was really struggling because, well, it's wrong. But the conversation that Sam alluded to that we had was, if we get thrown out this June, because we did everything we could to keep as many people alive in the province of Ontario through COVID, that's a price we're willing to pay. And so um, I think that is a stunning pro-life message. The difference between those two approaches is, is at the end of the day, if I keep you alive, but for a brief period of time, I took away some of your liberty, I can give you those back. But if I take away some, uh, if I give you all of your liberties and you die, I cannot give you your life back. And that's how we made the decision because life was more important than liberty and to move forward. And I think, and I think that is really boiled down to what's been driving this. Now, Sam, you want to go? Yeah. Can I build on that though? Because I, I think there's a really, you mentioned the word temporary and that's a very crucial part of this, hmm. right? So if, if I know speaking for, for myself, if the premier and cabinet and caucus had come forward with recommendations um, needed to you know, uh, reduce the impact of the waves and they'd said, these are permanent. Uh, we're keeping these in place. Uh, we don't have any plan to get rid of them because, you know, one life, one life lost is one too many. So, uh, therefore, we can never remove any of these measures, uh, which is, you know, what we're hearing from some of the opposition parties mm-hmm. right now as we're lifting measures. You know, most measures are gone, but for masks in Ontario, and those are disappearing Monday. Um, and we hear from, you know, the NDP and the Liberals, oh, it's too soon. It's too soon. Uh, if we took that approach of, of we're just going to always have in place extraordinary interventionist measures, because they are, they're mm-hmm. extraordinary. They're, they, they're extreme. These are not uh, normal measures. They shouldn't be normal. They shouldn't be normalized as as what the government should do every time that there's a disease outbreak you know yeah. um but if we had if they had come forward and said this is going to be something that now just is the norm every time there's a a bad case of uh an uh, infectious disease we're going <laughs> to shut everything down that's far different than saying you know once in a lifetime once in a century pandemic we have to put in place extraordinary measures for mm-hmm. a limited period of time recognizing that the plan is to remove all of these measures as soon as possible people want to say then okay well you have to give me an exact date the second you start problem is is you know you don't get a crystal ball you don't get told when you're at a level that people can recommence the other surgeries you, there's a lot of complicating factors to that although i i very much sympathize with the desire to say like oh i know i wish i knew exactly at this in this date that mm-hmm. that was going to all drop <clears throat> But that's a big distinction because mm-hmm. we've always understood that in our society at unique periods of time, there are things that um, suspend the normal way of doing business. Look at things like 9-11, look at the wars, look at even, you know, fuel crisis in the 70s, uh, you know, introducing rationing. These are mm-hmm. not normal things. They shouldn't be normalized, but there are unique circumstances where they're required. Now, would I have liked that to be required for two weeks instead of, you know, changing over the course of two years? Absolutely. Right. I think we all would have. Um, but that wasn't the situation. No. And so now looking kind of back and also forward, how do we say, um, okay, there were measures in place that were necessary. They worked. They saved lives mm-hmm. in comparison with other jurisdictions, by God's grace. Um, but we also need to remember that we can't normalize this going forward. And that's, that's I think, a tension. Uh, but it is one that the premier has talked about, you know, all these measures saying, um, you know, I can't stand them. I want to get rid of them as soon as he can. And, and he's following through with that. And I think that that's a big piece of that uh, is understanding that they're temporary and time limited. And and then to come back to, you know, using the provincial government is a very big, unwieldy stick. And, you know, one thing I learned being on municipal council, and I would encourage everyone listening, please get involved in the in the process mm-hmm. because we need more people, uh, and we were talking about that actually before we went on air, how important it is for people to put their hands up and be involved because you can represent one small constituency, but if you get some experience in the wider community, and I, I know it's a cost, get involved in municipal politics and boards and things like that. And you're just, because number one, it opens up your eyes to what the rest of the world looks like because we can tend to be pretty insulated in the re- reformed world. But getting back to what Sam said, 
you know, you're absolutely right. Because the conversation that the premier and I had on the morning of September 2nd was that he needed me there to make sure that we could give these people their freedoms back. Getting back to the provincial piece, government tends not to work terribly efficiently, which is something that we've been saying since the beginning. But I learned when I was on county council that probably, I, I estimated, 80% of what we do is to try and fix the unintended consequences of well-intentioned bylaws. Mm. That's when you work through things, ask stakeholders for input, take your time, get the wording right, months, sometimes years to develop these things. And you make mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember talking to um, Tim Hudak about when he was the minister and they did something with real estate stuff. And that mistake stayed on the books for 20 years until we just took care of that in the last term. And um, and he was the minister at the time, but they didn't see that one coming and it was a, it was a problem. And now you throw in a global pandemic and you're making decisions by the day, if not the hour with new information coming in and there are bound to be mistakes. And, and I would suggest that the restrictions were not this, um, I joke draconian measures. It was trying to guide 15 million people to think a little differently and to go in a certain direction to try to keep as many people alive as possible. I think the other key thing that Sam said was, you know, it's interesting to say, uh, talk about the societal cost of the restrictions and the fact that those things, but in looking in different jurisdictions in Michigan, you said Florida, is that suicide ideation, partner on partner violence, uh, drug use, they're up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then that makes me think of where are we as church? Because, um, what I fear is, is that um, not because anyone's not justified in, in saying what they say, but we've lost a lot of cre credibility in the culture around us. And, th and that's what I, I really fear through this. And I'll put that into an example. Uh, I'm an optometrist. I still try to get in there a few hours to keep my license up. My, my wife, Joni, has been running the practice. We are in the community. I'm a volunteer firefighter. I've been on county council. I've been on a bunch of boards and committees. And lady comes in and she says, why do your people hate us so much? And Joni says, well, what do you mean? And I'm the sole caregiver for my mother. She's in very frail health. I've been told by all of her doctors that if she caught a whiff of COVID, it would probably put her in her grave. When I go to the grocery store, when I go out in public, your people are there without any mask or anything like that. And they're just looking for the opportunity to tell you exactly what a coward you are, or what a afraid you are. And, and if you look at even look at them funny. And so why do your people hate us so much? And that's not the intent. You know, it's like my ward mate on council said a long time ago, and I think I can speak here to a reformed thing. So uh, a population, but you know, he goes, you Dutch people. You come here and you're too good for our churches, so you start your own. You're too good for our schools, so you start your own. He goes, you're even too good for our soccer leagues and baseball leagues and hockey leagues, so you start your own. That was never the intent. But what the world sees as they watch us in action in our communities, and is it's tempered by that. And having your eyes open to what the witness by our actions, by our anger, by our, you know, and, and that is hard to watch mm -hmm. because I think that affects our credibility of the witness that we have before, uh, the, the people that we want, uh, to come to our church. And then, you know, and, and the, these are all like, I was exactly the same six years ago. I pro I, I hate to admit this, but I would probably be in Ottawa. Um, I laughed at the memes about Justin Trudeau and Hillary Clinton. And, um, but I'm not that person anymore. I don't want to be that person anymore, quite frankly, because I think that gives such a poor witness and, 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 and it, and it justifies and it solidifies what the world already thinks about us. Um, and, and then just, we believe in a sovereign God. 
we believe that God is in control and can turn the heart of a king just like that. We believe that. Have we shown that in the last two years? And I would say no. Um, and and, and, and if, if we believe what we say we believe, and people send me angry messages that uh, they're praying right now for me and that I would have the courage. And I said, well, if you're praying anyway, and I, and I don't mean to be spotting, and you guys know what that means. <laughs> if you're praying anyway, it is the premier is committed to keeping as many people alive through this as possible. He will react in a way that, to the best of his information, is going to save as many people alive as possible. So if you're praying anyway, why not just pray that God would take away COVID right now? And 15 minutes from now, everyone in the ICU would wake up and go, man, I feel great. Can mm -hmm. I have some dinner? Because God is just as capable of doing that. And he brought COVID to us. And where I have ended up in, when is this going to be over, Bauma? I said, when the church learns what God is trying to teach her, and not a moment before. And from what I've seen so far, I would submit that we've been pretty poor students. And that's a very strong thing to say, <laughs> but that was why I wanted to come here today and just propose a different view yeah. because I listened to all your episodes yeah. than what's been here so far. And I wanted to get that point across is a sovereign God, the love that we should be demonstrating for our fellow man. And the fact that if you think I'm crazy for my COVID response, that's okay. Hmm. But don't, I, I don't, if you have a different response, I don't say you're not a Christian. Yep. But by the same token, then that means I have a different response. Please don't call into question my faith yep. because I have a different view than yours. And I need to remind myself of that when I want to get angry with someone because they don't agree with what I'm saying on those things. But that's what's critical. And then what is the world seeing in yep. us? If we truly believe the Great Commission and what Paul said when he was willing to become all things to all people, but that Christ, Christ might be preached. And that's what I bring here to the table today. Okay. Well, that's good. That's like that's like a half an hour. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's good. You're allowed that's to good. interrupt us. We're probably no, this is, no, this is good. This is just like, it gives us a really good understanding of, of you know, where you've been and, and, and. Like it's a really clear explanation. It's also important just to let you guys say your piece too, because yeah. I mean, j just well, like I, I appreciate you guys coming on, and it takes uh, mm. some courage to do that. Especially We've had multiple all, episodes to say our piece, so yeah, you know, election <laughs> season too, and uh, it's it's good to uh, to get your opinions out there and to to share your point of view. Oh, I do have some questions, but go ahead if you have I, something to say. I wanted to just build. I'm I'm sure we're kind of like building off each other. Nah, here, that's but, fine. But we'll get to you. Questions. You brought a really important point about about the church. Um, people are in every institution, right? Institutions are made up of people. Yep. The government is made up of people. Our courts are made up of people. Um, we have to remember uh, that the people who are providing advice and the people who are making decisions, um, many of them are not Christian, right? I would argue most aren't. But when we think about the church, what I often hear when I hear people speaking about the church needs to speak up, right? The church needs to take a stand. The church needs to X, Y, Z, you fill in the blank here. Mm. They're thinking of the church as an institution, which of course th there are the institutions of the church, a hundred percent, but often they mean like the consistory has to take this stand or everyone has to go and do this type of thing. But another way to perhaps think about the church is also as those people being engaged in everyday life and being engaged in the processes that come to the decision tables. Mm -hmm. So the reason I bring this up is because um, our, our form, I'm not sure about our current medical, chief medical officer of health, but I know for a fact that Dr. Williams, the former chief medical officer of health was a faithful, is a faithful Presbyterian, uh, went to church every Sunday before the pandemic, according to what the speaker told me. <laughs> um, I know that, uh, uh, I believe Bonnie Henry, uh, who's the chief medical officer of health in another province, is also a, a uh, believer. And their work is, is influenced by that, right? They see 
the importance of loving your neighbor uh, and loving God by loving your neighbor through that action. Um, and they probably are members of churches. I know for a fact, Arthur Williams is a member of churches. When we think about the advice that comes to both the premier and to cabinet and to caucus um, and the decisions that come through the chief medical officer of health, even in the Ontario science table and, and you know, the sub tables and the many, many advisory bodies from academ academics to uh, hospitals to, you know, the pediatric cares, all of these pieces. Um, when we think about the church being involved, I, I, I often hear people, we need more people to run for politics. We need more people to run for politics. It's true. We do. I would love to see. Uh, more people of faith involved in politics um, and, and and bring that that perspective uh, into the public square. But we also need good people at all those levels of the institutions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We can't just go and present petitions. Petitions are good, but what you're doing with a petition is you're walking up to the steps of that institution, whether it's the academy or the sciences or government or law, and you're saying, please change your mind uh, because of this petition. And, and that's well and good. And that's, that's, you know, that's proper in a democratic society. That's healthy to have that. But another way to think about uh, the church's role can be in training people, in engaging people who are involved in those institutions so that the advice that is coming, whether it's from Dr. William or Dr. Moore or the like 400 people who feed into him, mm -hmm. right? The, the advisory tables that he kind of coalesces that data and coalesces those arguments and comes up with a presentation to cabinet, the ministry of health and the premier and ultimately to caucus as well. Um, if along those steps, you have people of faith whose um, motivation is to show life, care for life and care for truth, which is the two pillars that I, I really believe, um, you know, we, we confess we serve a God of life and a God of truth and those need to come through. Um, that has a profound impact as well. Mm. And so I just want to urge, perhaps, when when thinking about the church, don't just think about it as an institution. Think about it as the people who will make up so many other institutions as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there's lots to digest there. I'm going to suggest. Yeah. Okay, well, you suggest something. I got like seven yeah. areas we can go after. Yourself. Okay. Yeah. So you're worried about filling this. Eh? Oh, yeah, no. Right. Oh, we'll be fine. <laughs> okay. So I, I would just like to say on points of agreement. That for sure. On the, as far as the salvation issues are concerned, there's I don't think there's any place for that. You could disagree on this in good faith, and that's fine. Perhaps the dicey issue maybe is if you have you know churches that do the uh, mandatory vaccination to get into a church, but that is a church decision. I recognize the government has not taken it that far, so that would be. But the point of agreement is let's treat each other civilly and respectfully, and not uh, mischaracterize each other's faith based on our our politics. Now, I think based on what you've both said, I would submit that it's kind of in three categories. So you have the data side of things, which is important. You have kind of the first principles, life, liberty thing. Um, and then you also have like the witness of the church and how that gets played out. So that's kind of how I see their their point of view. Do you want to hit them with some questions based yeah, on any I, of those three? I think I just want to hit the the last one. That one probably will disappear a lot faster. I, I don't like the first one data is it's so hard and i think the 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 trust is is a problem there but we can talk about that later first principles is very important and we can we'll discuss that too but the the way the church is viewed um to to will's point like um i think it's sometimes mis misinterpreted or, or maybe brought to too far um the witness of the church people often like turn to the Dutch thing, right? Like mm -hmm. you mentioned like, yeah, your people don't really, you know, whatever. But I, I find that in Ontario and in, in Canada, we have a lot of communities like that, like the Italian community, the Serbian community. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many communities that are, uh, pull themselves away almost from, you know, what you say society in general or whatever and have their own areas. And, and I mean, a guy like Justin Trudeau has encouraged that kind of in our in our culture like to have distinct kind of groups so i understand that people like to go after the dutch people because you know but they i think the actions are are like to the second point that lucas said like they're they're a principled approach they're not um when they attack the church they really are kind of categorizing you know dutch reform people into a group because mm -hmm. it's easy and not looking at what the actual you know, the underlying belief is in, in their approach. So maybe the approach isn't 
you know, always you know, tactfully done and like maybe, you know, not wearing a mask and shouting in someone's face isn't the best approach, but, but we're all weak people. And, and there definitely are, um, you know, exceptions to the nice bucket full of grace that you mentioned. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, just that, just that point, um, I kind of wanted to go back to um, right away, right off the bat saying we were talking about um, the government, well, basically, like the life and liberty being the, the kind of um, it's kind of like the dichotomy, right? Like, do you go for one or or the other? And um, I think the problem a lot of people have will be the government assigning um, the risk level to you in your life. And I think that, to me, when you were talking, that's kind of where I felt like um, a little bit of the that overstep into um paternalism these yeah these kind of overarching like um i understand the health order but the government has also told me the risk level for me and my kids so what 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 specifically do you mean if i can interrupt yeah by a risk level for you and your children so well so we we talked about like um life life and liberty so protecting life and and having me protect other people's lives I'm being like, yeah, so as a, as a citizen, I'm being told by the government of, at all levels what the, the chances are of a negative outcome from my actions. Mm-hmm. And so we had the you know, stay at home, save lives slogan mm-hmm. that was plastered from the, from the Ontario government. Yeah. But also municipal governments have done you know, bylaws and certain different um, kind of um, media campaigning, kind of like signage that has to be posted and stuff like that indicating to me that if I leave my home, I'm now pushing people or, or endangering people's lives. Um, and having, being told that, but I know the facts of my situation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned your, your mother to who you care for, uh, Will. Um, I had a similar situation. My mom actually passed away right before COVID, mm-hmm. but she was in, uh, in ICU and we had to be very careful with what we were bringing in there, but that's a risk level at a personal level that we could manage, right? As a family and a community. And if we weren't feeling well, we wouldn't visit and stuff like that. So, but being told that when you leave your home, that now this is the risk that you are, you know, taking, but also, you know, imposing on the world. Yeah. That's, I think that's where people start struggling with. Well, and, and, and I completely agree with that. But that's that's that speaks to um, the blunt instrument that a provincial government or even a municipal government mm. is, and and again, as I look at the restrictions, they are not. Um, well, it's like church order; um, it's sanctified common sense. And how I look at it also is from my experience as a volunteer firefighter, and we had to fight fight for that once in a while. But every policy and procedure that we have is we made it; we had to keep it, fight for it. At the bottom, it says, or as conditions on the fire ground dictate, mm-hmm. which here's the rule. That's what it means. Here's the rule. You, thou shalt do this. Yeah. Unless you can demonstrate why you went outside of that because of the situation that you were in. Mm. Now, were those, those exceptions, were there any of those exception clauses in any of the restrictions that the provincial government put in? No. But again, it's to try to direct 15 million people into mm-hmm. the same thing but were some people left in extremely difficult circumstances by that yeah you bet they were yes that's you that's the were. challenge and then but but that's what's flickering but that's the downside of that you mm-hmm. know my wife uses the example of when polio was endemic mm-hmm. if you're caught swimming in a creek you got fined or went to jail right i was in the 50s i don't i don't remember the protests of people going to Ottawa or Toronto demanding their rights to swim wherever they wanted. If there's a difference in our culture also that, and I think part of our culture being immigrants, most of us owning our own businesses. Um, I do. Um, no one's going to tell me what to do. And so yeah, I think pushing I think it's back- also the fear that, that we see our media um, landscape changing and the, and the influences that certain um, large, like, you know, larger powers than us have 
in society. So it, as an individual, you feel like you're being played against instead of um, having an actual, you know, seat at the table or having your word being heard. And so on that, we believe in a sovereign God. Mm -hmm. He laughs at this stuff. You know, you hear these things, yeah, which, about is, the, which is the, encouraging the world, but, yeah. world economic forum, mm -hmm. uh, the great reset, you know, yeah, these are probably the dreams and schemes of men, um, at some level. Um, but we can chuckle because we know how it ends. Mm -hmm. So I, but I think that's where people struggle is that they don't want to be playing into that mindset for their neighbor's sake, even. So then so to, my, my, to, I think they've, People feel a lot in, in to act in a certain way to say even wear a mask and and to is participating in that um, experience of or showing your neighbor that what they're hearing on mainstream media is correct. So I think that's where they struggle. And I think there's a spectrum like people have kind of landed all sorts sorts of places on it. But. but but if we actually did first principles, what we're supposed to be doing, living such lives and using such words that people would ask us for the reason that are the for the hope that is in us. And we actually share the gospel and through that, and we really pray for our society and we see a great awakening. Mm. Um, all of those issues you're concerned about take care of themselves. Mm. They're gone. And so my response to that is yes, hear you totally. But when I have a colleague from across the way sending me a note saying, I don't know why you're different, but thank you for, having good questions and good debate today from an opposition member, I mean, a member from Humber River, Black Creek, or when a colleague asked me, aren't you one of those evangelicals? And I chuckled and I said, well, I don't know if I'm worthy of that, but yeah, to the watching world, sure. And he goes, how come you're so nice? Hmm. And I never get accused of that. <laughs> <laughs> but when... The, the, your issues are important, but I believe you have to take a step back. And if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, instead of getting upset about those things, the issues that you're upset about mm -hmm. will take care of themselves. Right. Well, okay, maybe just to push that a little tiny bit further, because I'm sure Lucas wants to get into something else. Um, we all, the common, um, one of the common examples or, or analogies that I've heard with, especially with the mask mandates, has been, um, like a fire code thing, especially in the church. Um, basically comparing, well, the, the government has a role in, in determining fire codes and what safety is. Um, my response to that has been a little bit like, if you were pushing um, the fire code to the limit, because you have so many people, you're blessed with so many people in your church that you're just overflowing. There's no governments that's going to come in and say, tomorrow, look at here, like, you have to exclude people from your services now because you're over the capacity. So there would be, a, there would be a very uh, gentle and slow moving process to move that facility or church into a bigger facility. I mean, there's, I don't know if we have an example of like cops standing at a door, making sure fire codes are being. Um, but all those in my experience have been complaints driven. Correct. So, right? so, so usually, fire, gets, fire passed, code, same usually thing. gets past the, the state of law, just like a speed limit. Like you, you're getting past, um, you know, what is the acceptable limit. Um, that is, it is technically a law, but that's where I see people say, well, masks are the law. So now you have to, you know, abide by X and Y. They don't leave room for exemptions, even though the law does. You get into all these, you wait into all these things that, um, can we go back to first principles then? Because I think we're getting into it. Like, I, yeah, I, yeah, I understand sure. that because you can always take analogies. I've used the analogy of uh, for public health with um, uh, water in a church, right? It's not like we don't say, hey, we have authority over this church building, so you can't put fluoride in my water that's, that I'm mm. drinking in the church. It's like, no, you, you're tied into the public health, right? So there's all sorts of analogies. They yeah, always yeah. break down at a yeah. certain point 100%. because it's kind of a unique situation. But you talked earlier about going from first principles and you, you – you, those first principles you mentioned, you know, life and liberty and, and Will's also talked about some of those trade-offs that you're always going to have public policy trade-offs and unintended consequences. I think um, it's fair to say all of us have slightly different limits as to where we consider those trade-offs mm. to be. For for myself, I know uh, I'm a big believer in percentages, like a percentage approach to capacity limits. Um, since, you know, day one, 
uh, that's been something I, I've talked about is, you know, can we, instead of having a hard cap of 10 or five, can we say uh, it's, it's a, you know, 25% mm -hmm. instead of like a 50 number, which for example, in churches here in Ontario was the case, Alberta had like a cap of 50, which if you have a building of a thousand doesn't really, you know, that whole mm -hmm. thousand doesn't make sense, but some of the little, you know, like the small United church down the road, those fit 50 and they're jam packed. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think there's ways we can approach this, but those are all kind of bearing out of the principles. And, and my question would be, what are those principles, right? So you mentioned people perceiving the church or the reformed churches in a certain way because they're Dutch and, you know, the Serbians and the Greeks, they all have their own church communities. So I'm not arguing that, but are the arguments that are being made from our community then based off of principles or are they based off of rumble? And, and, and why I say that is, is based off of my inbox, right? So I go back to our confessions. Um, we talk about in the Heidelberg Catechism, right? Uh, having patience with governing authorities' weaknesses and shortcomings, but we also talk about the fact that uh, they bear the sword to prevent murder, which we would consider to be including uh, harming or recklessly endangering ourselves. So the government is allowed to build fences around ravines because that's to stop us from recklessly endangering ourselves. Um, we're called to protect our neighbor from harm as much as we can. And so I don't, unfortunately, I, I, when we're talking principles, I'm not getting people coming and saying, well, that's not actually what's meant there. And here's a different un understanding of those principles. I'm getting patriotical.com. Yeah, and I think it's what you what you just mentioned. Like, it's the line that people draw, right? And everyone draws their lines different places. But you can believe that the government bears a sword to protect prevent murder and also that we should not harm ourselves or others or endanger people. The line gets drawn in different places when the government says um, protecting others is so far as not giving somebody a cold. Right. And you're like, well, I've had COVID. I got vaccinated. I did whatever, but I still have to wear a mask to go do it we do whatever it's just right. like it's like so i gotta sing in church with a mask on which is not super easy mm -hmm. um and the feeling is that there's no way i can get around doing that um and there's no well, i mean we can talk about the timelines and the and things mm -hmm. but the problem is that people gave up liberties for this but they don't perceive the risk high either in their life in the, in those around them or they're taking a responsible approach personally. They're not visiting their their mom in a in an old age home. Or when they do, they make sure that they you know are three days maybe or you know I'm healthy and I do certain things. And people have always done that. Mm -hmm. People have always you know stayed home from school when they're sick. People have always not brought their kids to church when they're put them in the church nursery when they're you know snotty nose right. Like we've always taken these approaches, but it's always on a personal level. But that's not actually true. Because how well, often I mean, does your can, church? How, but you how, can argue with people in your specific church. There's no policy in right. place. But right. it's but going back, you, you're, one of your first things you said back there was um, all these restrictions for a cold. Yeah, that's not true. We've never done restrictions like this for a cold. No, but we've we've done it for COVID, and and and, and, it, it, and your assumption that everyone does the right thing all the time is also not true. Because no, that's true. In my I mean, that's, in my fifty years of going to church, yeah. true, but. What we're trying to do is give general direction because of the serious yeah. nature of this thing. And if if people are still debating whether this is serious or not, that's what the data the, comes down that, to. Right? You know that, and, and that's where a lot of this ends up. I find the yeah. conflict comes down to. I'll show that we've had that Texas and Florida, because those are always the ones people pick for some reason. Um, you know, they've had four times the amount of deaths per capita. I actually just my um, I just saw information just this morning looking up that. You know, Ontario has 1.4 ICU beds per thousand people, and Florida has 2.59, so pretty much twice as many ICU beds per mm -hmm. capita. Even with that, they've had four times the amount of deaths. Right? How many, how many so old people do they have? Probably they, 20 times nine, as many. No, we have 19% <laughs> of our population is over the age of 65. Theirs is 23%. So it's a 4%. And they get half of ours more. annually. <laughs> No, but, but, but my point, but, but but my, my can, point but, is that then it comes back down to the data, right? Because if someone says that it isn't a big deal, then I understand that they're going to have a lower consideration of the risk and a higher consideration of the liberty. Right. But if, if, if there is a recognition of the risk, then that also 
like we wouldn't be having a conversation about where the, the lines are if it was 50 percent mortality no right? absolutely not. we wouldn't be that's why um, it gets hard the number is like okay but what about 10 percent? what about four percent exactly mortality? exactly the problem is that that what people have seen is not 50 percent mortality no and so it had this been i think we it would be a very different conversation it would be very difficult Probably. but the heavy hand would have been welcomed by so everybody I, so what what would be an appropriate number then we don't know no, but I, but, problem, but if I can yeah. tell you straight straight faced that there's probably forty thousand people still alive in the province of Ontario because of the restrictions that the province of Ontario has done, okay, like that's just that's just data and incontrovertible. Would you have lived this way for two years if I could assure you that there would be forty thousand less abortions in the province of Ontario over the two years? Because you and what got me thinking there was when as soon as, as soon as you said old people in <laughs> Florida. Because that's a that's an argument which again blows up in our face all the time, when you think children are so important that you will dictate what a woman what can or can't do. We can have it go there if we want, but these are people that have had a good life, and that's a very dangerous place for a pro life Christian to go, especially with her views on medical assistance and dying, um, to use those arguments. And they always try to back it back off, but at the end of the day. My freedom is more important than some old person's life. But principally, if you asked that question to me, would you do this? Would you do that to save 40,000 lives? I personally would absolutely do that. But what I wouldn't do is tell the government that they have to tell everybody else to do that in order for that outcome. But then now, why? But then now what? obviously, that's a nuanced argument, but it's similar to what I tell, would I like everyone to go to church? Absolutely. Even if they don't get anything out of it, I would still love them to enter the, enter you know, cross the threshold of a church at some point, would I tell the government that they have to say to people, you know, you every year you have to go to a church once. There have been governments in the, in the past that have forced Christianity on people. Yeah, and we would, believe as Christians that's wrong. But I would say you're actually, that's not true. Because you are very willing to have the federal government tell a woman she can't kill her child. I'm not at all. You're, if we passed a law, oh, yeah, no, I mean, you're, what, what you're but, saying but, sorry, is it's no, wrong sorry, for a government to make people to keep people alive. Yeah, but you don't really believe that because you are very comfortable Not having the government. We're just having no, 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 no. no, no. no but I, as, I, as a pro life, as, as a yeah, no, pro life Christian, if Justin Trudeau introduced tomorrow a a law finally a heartbeat yeah. bill, yeah, you would be very comfortable with the government telling people they must do certain things to keep people alive. Yeah, absolutely. But you just told me that that's wrong. No, I, because the the risk in that situation is 100% death to certain individuals. And we know that what that data is. And But I think his point is that there's personal about, uh, arguments about personal autonomy that are trade-offs again in that situation. If, right? if the trade-off in that situation was Justin Trudeau brings in a bill that says you cannot have an abortion, but as a result, everyone needs to have this medical procedure. Then it becomes problematic because you're telling people who are not at risk to save the people who they have no connection to, to go undergo some intervention and, and liberty loss. No, exactly. So because it doesn't so that, affect, then it becomes so, challenging. So because it doesn't affect us personally, because we'll never do that. It's fine if the federal government does that to other people who would. And in fact, that's a weaker argument than what we say is everyone shares the pain in order to keep tens of thousands of people alive, even though it may yeah, not affect we, me I mean, personally. But we, but we like that. But it's it's like it's like no, the, it's, not it's like a Russia like Ukraine thing. <laughs> it's like we can, you know, we yeah, can yeah, what, what yeah, if anyways. we? Yeah. OK, let's let's get let's back to <laughs> like, back to these baskets again. We have the data, which which kind of seeps under everything. And, and it does. Definitely, if you don't agree on the data, it's very hard to agree, which, on which is tricky because, you know, there's stats and there's statistics and there's there's damn lies and it's it's very hard <laughs> to tell all the difference between even if you have the data what is the number that's the other thing well th this is the tension point we keep hitting as well but i think i think a lot of this comes down comes down to communication and messaging and i think to your point about a lot of people send you stuff from alternate sources we there's been a, a massive breakdown in trust and if if mm -hmm. this if you you guys have been making this case at the beginning of the pandemic if you had a crystal ball and you could see what the next two years were going to be. Uh, it might be a lot more believable. But now, you know, we've seen back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. A lot of trust has been broken. Um, I, I think if I were to to make the case for a lot of people, even if it doesn't always get made very well, and people they they can be right, but potentially, 
but they can also have poor motivations or poor sources. And I think the concern uh, from a lot of people is in this life liberty debate is that even if even if the data is legitimate, and I'm not even really going to argue it because I think there's a lot of fair points in there, even if the data is legitimate, there's a consistent pattern in history where once a government takes a certain amount of power, they're very hesitant to give it back. And I think a lot of people who are concerned about overreach and COVID measures are concerned about the church and the freedom to worship mm-hmm. and freedom to, yeah, to glorify God and yeah. to gather together. A precedent for future but, governments. And those, I, I think that's a fair, but that's a fair point, right? And that's something that I know we've talked about as as caucus and even uh, I'm on the select committee for emergency management oversight. I just asked the solicitor general about how can we ensure that these types of extraordinary extreme measures aren't normalized. And, yeah. and she talked about <clears throat> the need to ensure that these powers are being removed or mm-hmm. the, the reopening Ontario act is expiring at the end mm-hmm. of the month. Right. We intentionally got out of the emergency act uh, back in 2020 because there were tons of powers that we didn't need things like confiscation, confiscatory powers, uh, search and seizure powers, all mm-hmm. sorts of powers that were given under the Emergency Act that we were like, the government shouldn't have this much power all the time. Mm-hmm. So we're going to put most of the powers back in the Emergency Act box and create a new box that has far less power, the Reopening Ontario Act, which still provides a fair amount of power, more than normal, but less powers. And now that's expiring, right? And we need to ensure that once it expires, we're not normalizing a lot of the things that have been put in place. So I think that's a that's a very... Mm-hmm fair argument i would just say that everyone agrees on that almost everyone agrees there there mm-hmm. are those who would say yeah we should like again the ndp you know and, and the liberals have been saying uh we need to they wanted us to lock down far sooner far harder they wanted you know uh requirements for going to school they wanted all sorts of things but at least on uh, in in our team and there's disagreement even within our team there's 70 mpps from mm-hmm. across the province you know there's it's like a, i always say a consistory meeting like 70 mm-hmm a constituent meeting of 70 people yeah, who yeah. don't agree and are from de- very different parts of the province. Um, so not everyone agrees there, but generally there's this recognition that these are extraordinary time limited and we cannot hold on to them for one second longer than necessary. Now the problem is, is people don't agree on what is one second longer than necessary. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. premiers might be different than yours, which might be different than mine, which probably is different than Will's. Yeah. And that's where the challenge comes. Yeah. And on the trust issue going further back, um, I would submit that that was gone long before COVID started. Well, I would agree, but it's, it's by accelerated. The, this no, not even accelerated. This just highlighted that, and especially in our communities. Um, and I've said for a decade, if you want to see exactly where our people are on authority, African history, just ask everybody to wear blue next Sunday mm. and watch the letters roll in. Yeah. Yeah. And something arbitrary. Um, and, 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 um, because people question authority. Yeah. And I would say coming from a Dutch immigrant, do your own thing, the type of people that yeah. leave a country and do that, that's yeah. somewhat in them to question authority, which is why they went there. So I would say uh, not not new symptoms. I would say the uh, internet and those things have uh, accelerated that yeah. very, very much because when I get a dozen emails from the same saying the exact same yeah, thing yeah, yeah. i'm like where did you get that from yeah mm. um and well it's been going around with my friends yeah but do you know who wrote it and do you know what their intent was mm-hmm. you know because you know it, it uh, in 2019 uh 19 of the 20 most popular facebook pages in the united states of america were from foreign uh troll sites mm-hmm. mostly uh twisting um conservatives views on certain things. Hmm. And um, my thought is always when I get one of these letters is who's most motivated to get our people mad at our government. Hmm. And I'm intrigued by that because Hmm. no one has answered me yet who wrote this in the first place, who got, who got this ball rolling. And, and um, so I think we're also very susceptible to um, being, um, used by certain people. And I, and I question, and, and when I ask, so who wrote it, what was their motiv- motivation for writing it? And I haven't had too many people be able to actually answer that question before when I get those 20 emails in. So, but okay. even on that, it's, there's, there's a healthy amount of, there, there is a good level of skepticism too. Right. And, and 
it's healthy in a democracy for people to question the government's actions yeah. and not just expect it. In our circles, too, I, I mean, there's a valid, when I say that, I, I mean, a reformed the reformed community, and I'm making a broad characterization, so it's not always the case. But we rightly, you know, the government, broadly speaking, doesn't recognize that a preborn child is a child. No. You know, so right away, it's like, well, your credibility is fairly low if, yeah, yeah. if you can't recognize something that's so obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that creeps and then you can multiply that by, with by all different areas, social right? Yeah, sure. And, yeah. and you say, okay, so you're clearly like <laughs> going against common sense here. Mm -hmm. So we're now going to pick up that distrust and apply it to other areas. And yeah. that's exactly, again, where it comes down to with the data, mm -hmm. right? Because I often ask the question, okay, so you don't trust the data that I have from StatsCan or the CDC. Yeah. Why? Well, because everyone knows they're lying. Why does everyone know they're lying? Well, because like, well, look a at couple, where- A couple things, maybe just to point to on yeah. that, is that even your government has admitted that they got the data wrong on multiple occasions. Yeah. So how does anybody, that's why I hate going back to the data and this, mm -hmm. this quote, quote, science, because you, there's no way for me to do primary research to verify any of this. How am I, I can't do surveys. I can't do, um, I'm not a scientist. I don't know. So mm -hmm. I have to take the data at face value. And I've honestly, I've used the data off of the Ontario website mm -hmm. in arguments in to my favor because I use numbers that were actually inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, look at this. And then the net data changes. So yeah. then, or if you go back to the color and, zone situation. And they've, you know, yeah. and you know, like I, I but get the situation it. It's like changes your, your government softly. So then why like, would, oh, I don't want to, you know, you don't want to publicize it, to be honest. I don't know. Why would do, admitting but. that some of our numbers were wrong and trying to correct that decrease trust? Yeah, because that's we, what you're saying. We would just stand by. Because so if people, we have, people have thought, like what Sam said, and people have thought that it's been, been, been misused or, or misrepresented. And some people have even said, well, this is what you guys are doing. And then to have the measures not change immediately after that recognition is the mm -hmm. problem mm. to have it said, look at our numbers were wrong. And so that's a percentage that we were wrong, but not to take any other measure. Mm. And then you see like that number of, you know, maybe we were at 4% mortality rate. Now that's dropped to 2%. Mm -hmm. Now, does that not change in your mind? It, and to not have the, the admission of that um, very publicly. That's the, that's where I think the distrust. But comes. I would say that the, the, the impact of it is very public because the way the measures are changed, the way the measures change has been very drastic. If you look at March of 2020, the measures that were implemented when, you know, in our first caucus meeting, we're told, if you don't lock everything down, you're going to have 180,000 dead Ontarians by the end of the year, right? Is very different from as it evolved, as the situation changed and we recognized where mortality rates were highest in places like long-term care and what the impact of certain settings were. Then instead of saying everything's shut down, we're saying, okay, um, higher risk settings are at a percentage capacity. Like let's take Jan let's take this January uh, restrictions, right? I know everyone was furious about January. No one liked it. But the reality is, is that was very different than March of 2020 because I was more furious about the one before where we couldn't golf. <laughs> Not true. Last spring. yeah, no, but, right. uh, yeah. but and I take a different view because we were told originally we were looking at potentially 100,000 deaths if we did nothing. Yeah. Here we are two years later. We've had 12,000. We've had 40,000 less than Michigan. Fortunately, yeah. they've done measures too. They have so the what, old people. In, so in what, the so what would the actual? Well, yeah, but what would Michigan. what would the actual number have been if no one had done anything? Mm. And I would su I would submit based on where we are, based on where we've been in comparison with others, we probably would have had 100,000 dead in the pro if we had done nothing. But people don't believe that. That's the right. That's no, they, they don't the have kicker. to believe it. Yeah. But when you see what we've done in comparison to others and how far we are ahead of them, yeah. and but, they also but done But parading things. the response as the solution, it's like saying, you know, uh, are, you know, oh, shucks, I can't think of a good example, but saying like, there's no deaths. Uh, oh, let me see. You know, well, let's, let's leave that. I, I think, can't think of an example. No, people, people talk about alligators in the city. It's like, well, there's no alligators in the city. So, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah no, but, but, but that's not a thing. Could so. you have accomplished the same thing via government direction? As opposed to government decree, and and that those, the, and those are really good conversations you've talked about to the have. Blunt instrument, right? Mm, yeah. But I th I would submit that uh, a provincial government is probably incapable of doing that because uh, uh, what's a good example of of uh, direction given that in in a situation like this we don't have any. But that's why 
I appreciate the fact that even federally, there has to be an inquiry about the emergency order. And we will do things in hindsight, looking back at this Mm -hmm. in the future. And did we do everything right? No, because government doesn't do everything right ever. Um, But I think, and that's where the trust issue comes in is, (laughs) yeah. And, and, and um, so what's interesting is, you know, I talk to people, yeah, and the premier flip flops all the time. I'm like, yeah, he does. Or you could say he got new information and changed his mind to go in a different direction, which he's done a lot. Mm -hmm. And, but instead of enhancing trust, because he's willing to listen to new data, um, that just means he's a flip flopper. Well, the trouble with that is, uh, and I, I, I agree you guys, um, like I agree on the, on the principle there. Like, yes, if you receive new information, it's healthy to change your mind. However, the realities of when a government does messaging is you're going to de-emphasize where you got it wrong in the past because mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. not helpful. And you're going to, and you have to make a new decree and you have to be perceived as sure and confident that this is correct. Yeah. So the impression people are left with, and this is on purpose and I understand why is that, Oh, uh, well, never mind that past, even though you're saying, yeah, well, we, we got it wrong. It's like, yeah, but that's not what people hear. People hear. No, you're right. Oh, like uh, now they're saying this. And yeah. what what are they like? Are they wrong? I never hear. Yeah, yeah that's a human pride issue with all governments, right? And every, frankly, all well, people like no. You got to get like, reelected. Most people aren't like, oh yeah, you know, well, I even a, so bad. Even like, a church council is not going to say, well, we got it wrong and whatever. But actually, what part of that I'm I'm running into now? Like even Monday, the mask mandate's being dropped, um, provincially, but the the government has still allowed private businesses to run their own mandates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So while that sounds good, but you're also still restricting liberties based on the whim of someone. Um, do that all the time. No shirt, no shoes, no service. Yeah. They have, so, a, they have a right to do that. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, so, but you're, you're introducing another level of, of, um, of power to other people. So not yeah. really though. No. So they had so it pay, before so though. Pick, the your poison. Institution. pick your poison. Do you, want to live in a country where the government dictates everyone that every business can or cannot do business with or not. No, but we've lived in that reality already where where the government did a bit of, and we're backing that back off so that people have the freedom to make those decisions and you're railing against. Well, that's a good thing that people have the freedom to make those decisions. Yeah. Yeah, Or not. But we've been also told that we can't go to a mom and pop shop. We have to go to Walmart to get our stuff. Um, so that's that's where we you know that's where you struggle but that's where the trust breakdown happens too right is because as was mentioned it's it's and and i think that that's where again going back to the confessions and recognizing that you know it doesn't say have patience with their weaknesses and shortcomings unless they do something that's just the, inconsistent the problem with it is isn't that somebody wants you to do something to get into their establishment now it's that they want you to do it because of a, a principled stand on health, which is, you know, we can take that stand maybe in an ICU area in a hospital, but saying no shoots, no, no shoes, no shirt, no service isn't saying you have to be injected with a vaccine or wear a mask. Okay. Can we talk about the vaccine? Because maybe? of, yeah, we really got into that because of, um, of health and the fact that you are now the, the feeling is you are endangering other patrons of this business, which is what we have been told. So the ironic thing about this is that I had to go to Walmart to get my fishing supplies because my local fishing store was closed down where, you know, he could very easily have done his own health measures and arguably better than Walmart. Now Walmart might require a vaccination and a mask, whereas he's not required to. So you can see, you can see how he was the dangerous one earlier and now he's the safe one. So and and it's more dangerous to go to Walmart. So now you need these extra measures. So it's there's there, and and it's again, not, it's not a logical. Um, we can we cohere, can logically coherent argument. So that's why people struggle. And that's why you go back to first principles and yeah. realize it's a blunt instrument. It works ineffectively on a good day yeah. when that's, everything is done right. Eighty <laughs> percent of what we do as legislatures is clean up the unintended consequences of well-intended legislation. Yeah. And pointing out the places where they failed is profitable for further mm-hmm. review but that doesn't condemn the motivation of the entire thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so saying that this steer store couldn't open, that was dumb. Yes. Does that negate the philosophy and the pro-life ethos that went behind? No, but the, the full decision. Uh, but personally, it was easy. Yes. It was actually an easy thing to do what you're saying, to take the pro-life 
stand and to do with the protections as a small business. And, though, and, that's, yet, and that's why we have hindsight. And exactly. No, but, right. But people saw this in foresight, which is the biggest problem. Anyways, go okay. hit us with the yeah, vaccine. I, I just want to talk about the vaccine mandate because I think for a lot of people, that was kind of the point where that was kind of the tipping point where they thought, yeah, okay, I might disagree. It's a little heavy handed, but, and I'm a little annoyed about it, but you know what? Okay. Like we trust somewhat that they're acting in our best interest and they're in a tough position and you know we these guys have to do what they got to do and so let's let's clear that up where did the province of ontario have a vaccine mandate uh, okay well heavily coercive oh. vaccine no where decree. where did the province of ontario have a vaccine mandate they had a vaccine policy for everything but where where was the only place they had a vaccine mandate well, long-term government care. long-term care so the only people by order of the provincial government that needed to have a vaccine to go to work by order of the provincial government. Yeah, but see, that's, long, that's that, going right back. I know, care. but that's going right back to what we were just talking about, which is it was not uh, a mandate from the government, but the government told businesses to make a mandate. So no, now you know. Mm-hmm. And, and again, going what, back. What happened? No. The result of what happened we, based we on asked, the policy is we, that you could not enter a we, restaurant, a bar, or anything like that. That's, 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 that's not a mandate. Not a mandate. The mandate. What you're talking about is forcing people to have a vaccination. That is the mandate. A QR code is a separate conversation after this one, if you want to get into that one. It's the same conversation. It is not. Vaccine mandate is you must have a vaccine to work. QR code is to be able to enjoy something sociologically in order to do that. Sure. I separate those two. Both happened. Absolutely. But you have to separate them in the conversation. Because the thinking behind them and everything else are two separate Very things. Yeah. Very different. Yeah, sure. But the but average in, person could clump them together. Results. But if we're having the conversation, let's talk about vaccine mandate. Then let's talk about QR code. Okay, let's do, let's uh, let's, do them separately. Good. But, but, but don't put them in the same topic of conversation because. Except uh, I think that they, there is a fair point that Ty's making, which, uh, sorry, that was very like informal. No, Tyler, I liked it. You I liked it. Uh, okay. It gave me butterflies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the point he is making is that uh, the government strongly encouraged or made it difficult to access a lot of regular services and things that we've just become accustomed to expecting Mm -hmm. without being vaccinated, right? Effectively impossible. Effectively, right. So, so then, and you and I know the rationale behind that, you know, wanting to ensure that uh, quote unquote higher risk people i.e. unvaccinated weren't in higher risk settings that was the argument behind it where they would be more susceptible to infection and increase the icu impact uh, and then the secondary impact of encouraging uptake in the vaccination so we we understand that but i think his point is just and i, I take your distinction between the two so what specifically his point was just more so that the government in its intent and practice was was creating an environment that had a lot of pressure to get it is that what you're saying yeah, where you're going yeah i mean that? like in essence like even you see I mean, let's just pick on the federal government because it's easier. I don't have to go after you guys. <laughs> uh, as if you're unvaccinated, you can't fly. So Ontario and Alberta both have are completely there's no mask mandates, no mandates. We're almost, quote unquote, back to a, a normal. I cannot fly from here to there as an unvaccinated person. Right. You know, if I'm unvaccinated. <laughs> um that see so that that um yeah i wouldn't defend that no i, I wouldn't not, wait to I offend, defend so that, it either yeah so that's, that's not, an easy that's one not cool so no. um is it a mandate no they're not saying i have to get a vaccine but they are saying you cannot access the service now okay right. and you're gonna you say well it is going to a restaurant the same you know is that my right the same as uh getting on a plane well i'll say my my movement but also me patroning a business and, and it's even, part of liberty. It, yeah, but even going out for dinner is not a big one. You want to have a fun one. Talk about visiting a dying relative in the yeah. hospital. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a big Which, one. It's horrifying. That's, a, that's yeah. a real one. Yeah. Right? And that's where the rubber hits the road. So, And those are very so difficult. So is it a mandate? We could just who, say. Who even cares? That doesn't no, even that's matter. Just, I don't, like, we're getting into semantics at that point. Like, no, well, I want to yeah. know what you guys got for this policy. Because what it created was a segregated society that got yeah. more and more divided. That and was the, the downside. Yes. Yeah. And what was very the upside? Much. The upside was we got a lot more people vaccinated. Five and, to seven percent. So that's, that range. that's the push. Yeah. Uh, was that the difference? Matter. Because we discovered in the meantime that like they can the spread is the same, no? But isn't, that isn't that what the data shows? That yes. unvaccinated vax? Yeah. And you know, we Similar were we were told with that the 
next wave would hopefully dash itself against a wall of vaccination and not do anything. But instead, what we found out was that it dramatically improved outcomes um, yeah. long term. And so was the course, that course of power worth it at the end? Time will tell. Right. But even there, like, I, I think it, we have to clarify, like, I, I'm not defending that. Uh, the, we, the premier and I have chatted about this before. Mm -hmm. There was a lot. I mean, the premier changed his mind on that because he felt it was necessary to stop going into a lockdown. Right. Yeah. So it, at the end of the day it came down to, and, and I have to be careful. I'm not breaking caucus confidentiality, but I think he was upfront about it, even in his remarks. Like yeah. it really, this was, that was probably the toughest for, for me personally, that was probably the toughest policy. Um, that came forward tougher mm -hmm. than lockdowns mm. uh, because it was you know, by its nature, it discriminated between the two and, and said like, mm -hmm. you can't act. Now the rationale behind that um, at a, like a public health level was again, they didn't want higher risk, quote unquote, vaccinated, unvaccinated in higher risk settings. That was the argument um, combined with increasing uptake. But the premier's big thing came down to, um, he said, it, Sam, it's, it, it's this, or we're going to go into a lockdown because yeah. that's what, that that's what the projections were showing as, as the increase. Um, and at that time with Delta, it did, it was much more efficacious against community spread than with Omicron, right? You have to remember this was Delta times. So the Omicron was very, is yeah. very, very transmissible. Delta was transmissible, but not as much in vaccinated. So at the time that was, that was the argument, but even so he understood and, and we'll, we'll say that he, he struggled with it too. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was like, when I spoke with him, I said, premier, you know, I, I, this is, this is the toughest one. I, I, I don't know how I can defend this because I, I really struggle with it. And he said, no, Sam, like, I, I understand that. Um, and, and, you know, that's from his perspective, it was that it was this or a lockdown. And he said, really, those are the choices. Now we can argue about whether or not that would have happened because again, it's a, it, you know, you look back and you say, well, you didn't have to do a, we didn't have to do a lockdown. That was our choice. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was what the situation, how, how it was portrayed. That's where the decision came from. That's where the decision came from. It, it, it wasn't, ah, you know, it would be great. Like, let's make sure that we have 20% of the population who can't access, like, going to restaurants. Stuff, which is somehow, some people come come to it and they, 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 they think it was done for fun almost, which is not at all true. No. But, again, I think a key piece in that, and really where it came down to, from, from my perspective, from a moral perspective, was, not creating that long term, that temporary, extraordinary measure aspect of it had to be there. And he was very clear. The premier was extremely clear. Um, and again, you know, still uncomfortable with it. But he always said, we're not going to have it one day sooner than than necessary. Maybe someone would have said that that was February. That's what Trudeau right? said. <laughs> but it's yeah. gone. Right. So he didn't. Well, Trudeau has said, we're not going to keep these measures one second longer than we have to. But we right. all agree that not flying from here to there doesn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So going back to that example, you're correct. But then you so, would say, you would say, good on the premier for getting rid of them as soon as he felt he could. Yes? I would say and stating that publicly. good on him for getting rid of them. Yes. <laughs> but oh, Okay. But then, but then we are we are talking apples and oranges in the response of the premier and the and the prime minister. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, the no, that's okay. true. The but can, prime can we can we Good we, Uncle Doug is you know a different story. Yeah, yeah. But can we acknowledge that a mistake was made on this? Or do I you would I would, I would say no because the best the best information that we had at the time from all the public health officials was that the only way we could avoid going into a lockdown was to put this in place. So what what as much level as, as would, awful as it was prior to their introduction, I privately and publicly shared my opposition to them. No, I know you did. Yeah. 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 So the if you look back in history, there's always these little moments that that you're like, okay, well now look at something changed right here. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the moment we saw that and I felt that something is changing here. We have now forced our free society to do something and segregated it. Mm. Yes. And that to me was a line that is like, yep. When you cross that there's very little going back yeah. and no, it's it not going to be your government. And hopefully, I mean, like get but, in in June again, but what's fascinating, have the same government, but the next government or the government after that, right. The and precedent the has been set. But many of our so, consistories yeah. did the exact same thing. I agree. Right. And it was a, and, and I'm still struggling with that when they started segregating people, when they had a COVID friendly section and everyone else do what they want. Yeah. It's such a hard. And, yeah. and, and so, um, but was that the best decision they could make at the time for the sake of the church? Maybe. I wasn't in consistory, so I can't answer that question. But it was very difficult 
in September yeah. when my church made some changes and they made it so that I could no longer attend worship. And as I told my elder, I know it's not the intent, but I feel like I've been accused, I've been tried, I've been found guilty, and I've been put under censure and removed from worship and the sacraments. And no one even asked me what yeah, I told not, me what I did wrong. No, that's right. And, that's and but right. that was something that happened in all of our churches. Awful thing. I think we're all agreed. But perhaps if you were in that room, the best possible decision given the circumstances, even though it, there's parts of it that were wrong. And I compare that exactly to the situation that our government was placed in back in late last summer where we had to do things that were wrong because that's the situation that we were in. Just like, and does that make all of our consistories that did that and did segregation um, grouping people, are they now all apostate and need to be thrown out? And I would say no. What could it have been the wrong decision? Maybe, but that you'll look back at that and learn from that. And I would say the same thing with our government. We will look back and learn from that. And even building on that a little bit, Will, and, and, and again, I'm not defending those types of things because I, I know how, um, and again, I'm not, I don't want to get in, I, I don't want to break caucus confidentiality, but I know how, de- I mean, the public, the premier's talked about this publicly. So I think it's, I think it's okay to talk about. He's talked about how divided caucus and and cabinet and the team were mm-hmm. and how divided he was personally over this, right? I mean, he's talked about the family dynamics. Uh, he's talked about how tough that was. Um, so so I don't think it's uh, a surprise to know that it wasn't exactly like, oh, yeah, everyone was like, let's do this. It was very arduous, mm-hmm. drawn out process um, with lots of give and take. But I look at a place like, I look at two places always, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And Alberta and Saskatchewan, right, last summer, July 1st, Freedom Day, Mm -hmm. masks are gone, best summer ever, you know, COVID's over, everyone, everything's back, hunky-dory, let's go. Um, And I remember so many emails from people, and I remember feeling this myself, being like, man, they are rocking it. Like, go Alberta, Saskatchewan, I hope this works, Um, because it it felt so good to see those places just kind of like go, right? And what happened by the time September rolled around? They had taken all their chips, thrown them in the middle of the table, made a big gamble, and and it it failed. They went back into a much worse lockdown than we had here at that time. Last September, Alberta and Saskatchewan were way more locked down than Ontario was. They went back and re, they introduced these these measures as a way of ensuring that places were able to stay open, but also not having higher risk people in those settings where they might get sick and impact the hospital system. So I I'm always cautious about thinking. I like to think I wouldn't have if I had been the premier, right, which is just this hypothetical you can never, ever figure out because you, I, I wasn't. Mm-hmm. You like to think, oh, I would have maybe done this a little bit differently or that a bit differently. I don't think. I, but then I look at places like Alberta and Saskatchewan where they're, you know, far more rural, arguably uh, more. Uh, I don't know if libertarian minded is the right phrase, but you know where I'm going mm. with that. Um, and if places like Alberta and Saskatchewan after their government said, guys, this is over. Like they took it on. They were like, we are back to life as normal. Let's go have fun. If they walked that back out of necessity, like they didn't do that for fun. That wasn't because they were like, oh, you know, it'd be great. Let's yeah, let's yeah. see if we can go back into lockdown after we did this. If they did that, um, it's hard to say that, oh, I would have done something so differently. Well, and we did that a year ago this month. We opened up quite quickly, not fully, oh, yeah. but we opened up quite quickly. And uh, the premier learned, and this is from my conversations with him, he learned a few lessons from that. Number one, all of the people that want you to open up really, really quickly, when the numbers start going back up again and things start going sideways, they all disappear. Mm-hmm. And, you're, uh, and you're on your own. And uh, number two is, uh, and he, 2,252 people died because we opened up too quickly last March. He knows that number. He thinks about it a lot. And he said, I will not do that again, which is why we've been cautious and and reactive. And if you're crass, you can say, well, that's just because you want to make sure that everything. Yeah, we do. Actually, we want to make sure that we can open and stay open as opposed to open and close back down. And is that a realistic approach? It, so far, so good. Opening slowly and carefully. And 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 like because a lot of this, you say it's a global thing. A yeah. lot of it doesn't have to do with Ontario. It has to do with, you know, it, things come in from everywhere. Actually, I was just looking at the, you know, the federal guidelines for people, unvaccinated people entering Canada 
um, is looser than vaccinated or unvaccinated people flying within Canada. So, well, we, 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 it's something that's, we can't control the federal government and we no, cannot you control the borders. Can, can Canada. you control Ontario or, or is it going to turn into like Western Australia where you like, you have to lock yourself all the way down and no outside people. No, yeah. I don't think so. I think we're going to, A, we can't because of just our geography connected to Northwestern U, or Northeastern U S like we're so dependent on travel. We're so dependent mm-hmm. on trade. We're so, like we're mm-hmm. very integrated into those supply chains and we're not an island, right? <laughs> so that, or I guess it's a continent. We're not Taiwan. Australia is a continent. Yeah, I guess. But either way, I, I don't think it's, but I also think we're in a very, very different place from all the conversations I've had with Dr. Moore on this and even his public commentary. You know, we have antiviral medications now. We have very high rates of, of uh, vaccination and community infection. Uh, we have, anti, you know, monoclonal antibodies. We have far more interventions and effective treatments um, and there's a whole list of different treatments on the on the website that that are being used that we didn't have two years ago. And 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 for that, I really do feel that that we're in a very positive place. I mean, can, I, again, I can't predict, you know, a variant with a 50 percent mortality rate and eight times is transmissible. Like, I, I can't know that. Right. Sure. But historically, we know what happens with these things. And I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I always want to caveat it. But we know that with the great flu, for example, you know, the, the Spanish flu in 1918-19. Over time, like we still have strains of that flu around mm-hmm. today, right? And over yeah. time, these things diminish, become a bit more virulent. They become seasonal and and we adjust to them. And I think that that's where we're at now. That's and Dr. I Morrison. know the premier does not want to use measures. Uh, no, learn, learn to live with it. Now, and, and in fact, when we first said it'd be like a couple of weeks, having been on the public health unit board for three years when I was on county council and vice chair, um, a new virus takes three to four years. To work its way through and here we are and so somewhere in the first six months my brain went from as we saw the realities of what this meant um that uh, this is going to be a three four year process and maybe with modern technologies and uh you know operation warp speed and the development of a, a vaccine very quickly um thank you president trump and vice president pence um um we can mitigate some of that and get through this faster but mm-hmm. it is something we are just going to have to learn to live with. And, you know, and then people are like, well, when is this going to be over? I'm like, I don't know what God has. In, and, and again, going back to first principles, I don't know what God's intention is with COVID. Because if he sends us a new variant that uh, is uh, more virulent than Delta and or virulent than Omicron and deadlier than Delta, all bets are off. That's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's Could, an impossible line. So. Okay. So we're and probably, I guess that's where I'd rather wrap it up is yeah. we serve a sovereign God. And we react to the situation the best that we can in a fairly non-Christian society and Mm -hmm. uh, bring our influences where we can. And I would say thanks to this guy next to me and a little bit from myself, you know, churches in Ontario stayed more open than any other public space, um, regardless of what the numbers were, even when it got down to five or 10 or whatever it was, than just about any other institution. And that's something where at the end of the day, the fact that through direct conversations and influence, um, we're able to maintain that. When in British Columbia, that wasn't the case. When in California, that wasn't the case, where it seemed that churches were specifically picked on. I would suggest to the people that listen to this how important it is to, number one, be involved and to consider who you're voting for and why. Uh, mm-hmm. Because of those, uh, even though never never getting out and yelling and screaming and working, I, you know, I, I, my joke is I'm an optometrist. I, we do our best work in a dark little room with the lights off. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and I believe that because we influence much more by having quiet conversations and showing people something that they don't know about than we do by yelling and screaming and having a sign in our hands. Yep. Can I just very quickly also say, um, we've been on here providing perhaps the perspective of why the government's taken the actions it has and, and you know, what the perspective was and the conversations that happened and, and some of the data and things like that. But I have a great deal of, of sympathy and understanding of the frustration that people mm-hmm. feel. Mm-hmm. And we also have to show grace to that um, because it can be easy if someone, let's say, you know, a classic one that always irritates me is like suicides are up. Well, they're not. Right. So then my first instinct is to be like, no, they're not actually you're wrong. But that's not the that's not the place I should be coming from. That's not what they're saying. They're saying, I feel like it's been so long. I'm frustrated. Mm -hmm. I've seen impacts on my kids' mental health or my kids weren't in school. Mm -hmm. I've seen 
this hurt my community. Mm -hmm. I've seen my local barbershop close and that's all coming out in that phrase. And I know um, I've heard from a lot of constituents who have suffered. Like I'm not going to, we're not going to pretend there was no collateral damage. There was, right? We, we know that people and, lost and jobs. people lost jobs. Uh, societally, obviously we're seeing that. Um, and there's a lot of need for healing uh, within the churches, within society, within um, families, within families. And, and we have to show grace to that. So I just want to also express that, that understanding. Cause I hear it. I understand where people are coming from. I'm frustrated <laughs> and I think we're all frustrated. Um, and I don't want it to just have been that, you know, we got on here and sort of defended, defended, defended. Yeah, yeah. We also do understand that. And we advocate, we advocate for that balanced approach. We mm -hmm. talk to the ministers and to the premier and to caucus about what we're hearing from the people who email us with these concerns mm -hmm. and try bring that onto the table in those settings as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I have one question maybe to wrap it up, but I would say I appreciate you guys coming on. I think it's been, it's been helpful. I think I've, I've gained more trust in, in the process given this conversation and it's, it's good to see the inside. And I know we've had plenty of conversations off, off the record, so to speak, but, uh, it's just, it's good to do this. It's good to sit down mm -hmm. and to, and to hear from you guys. And mm -hmm. you guys are in the thick of the fight for, for two years and yeah, you're good men, you're Christian men, you're faithful men and, and you've been acting, uh, to the best of your ability according to your faith. So I guess, uh, the one question I have going forward then, if hopefully this podcast has been able to build some unity and some understanding, is can we expect a bit more of a balanced approach? Because I think when you say three to four years with COVID, again, right away, people are going to get mm -hmm. a little anxious about that. Yeah. Oh, man, are we going to do this again next winter? And yeah, we're gonna whatever, yeah. like mask for the flu now, we're gonna mask for the flu yeah. and back, are we gonna to the back to the vaccine measures again. Are we going to see more instead of a heavy on the vaccination approach? Like, yeah, vaccines a tool but also monoclonal antibodies and other therapeutics and getting outside, being active, vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Like, are we going to see more of a balanced approach in terms of that? I think uh, from what I've seen, that's what the premier has been really talking about, right? Saying we need to learn to live with it. Um, we're through some of the, I believe, I genuinely, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but I genuinely believe um, we've gotten through it. I would argue We've gotten through it a lot better than a lot of other jurisdictions in Ontario because of the measures taken, whether or not everyone appreciated them as balanced or not. Um, and I don't think we're going to see a return of, of drastic measures. Does that mean we're not going to have hand sanitizing stations a lot more frequently? No, I think we will. Does sure. that mean um, I saw someone say, you know, uh, I'm not going to wear my mask as often in 2023 as I did in 2021, but I'm going to wear it more than I did in 2019. And I think that's fair. I, I, I think, um, you know, people are just going to be more conscious of uh, the vulnerability of people with comorbidities or the vulnerability of seniors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's going to have an impact. I, you know, you mentioned the fall. Uh, we often see flu seasons in long term care. And guess what? You can't go into those places when they're in outbreak during mm -hmm. a flu season. Could that come back in the fall? Potentially. I don't know. Right. Um, but but I think the. The, I feel, and this is, again, I don't have a crystal ball, so I want to be careful, yeah, but yeah. I feel that the age of drastic lockdowns and huge government intervention uh, for communi this, this communicable disease um, is passed because of a lot of those advancements. Uh, but again, uh, from what the Premier said too, like living with it um, also means that we need to show grace to people who might feel still fear, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fear you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe that person who's still wearing a mask isn't trying to virtue signal. Maybe they're actually, you know, they're, yeah, they're something you, you got to think about all the time because because we talk about grace on both sides. And it also goes, you know, like people who are un, aren't wearing masks, for example, often are well, oh, I feel so targeted because everyone's looking at me. Well, you know, when you go to church and you're like one of the only ones masked, guess what? People look at you funny then, too. Mm -hmm. Right. And they think you're trying to prove something. Well, no, you're just, you know, trying to follow what you think the yeah. best way is. So grace is going to be needed. Um, I can't provide a speculative no that's, that's <laughs> yeah. fair i just yeah i think it, it comes from a, have we raised the bar on um on these things like have we are we now at a point where we where the lockdowns in long-term care um homes and stuff like that because of the flu which we did before um like respiratory outbreaks is that the new bar like are, are we raising the bar for um because it's on everyone's mind now we have an opportunity to but also i think it's a fear from people that that now we are going to require a certain level of care for people. And I think people want to return to, you know, the way things were. 
No, um, I think that's not the right, but we, we've improved care. I look at things like, okay, so mm-hmm. we're getting into long-term care, but um, four hours of care now, we're, we're bringing forward policy to increase from two and a half hours of care for each resident in long-term care. We're spending huge amounts to build mm-hmm. updated long-term care so it's less joint rooms and it's more single rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not going away. I mean, improved infection control measures are not going away. Yeah. Um, improved uh, surveillance in long-term care that's not going away, but I think that's a good thing, mm. right? Like we're, we're, we're I, I think if anything, long-term care was exposed as an area with a lack of investment over the last two years. I don't want it to go back to 2019 for yeah. Pete's sake, right? So yeah. so there's going to be changes that are permanent. I look at things like digitization um, for ex- accessing, uh, you know, legal services or Service Ontario, the amount of things that got moved online so mm. that people didn't have to go stand in the lineup. That's a good thing. I don't want to go back to standing in a lineup for three hours outside of service Ontario. So. Yeah. So, and, and I would agree with that. I, to predict the future, we can't, no, um, no. I don't know what's coming. Uh, I would agree with Sam that based on the best information that we have, we're probably through the worst of this. Right. And, uh, you know, you read some incidental reports about an Omicron variant, two, four, three, point yeah, whatever B, it's called yeah. now. And, and, it's and, not as catchy as it used to be. No, <laughs> but, no but, but, you know, and, and when Omicron came through, Joni and I were talking and we're like, I'm, I'm hoping this is the one that enough people get exposed to it, that, yep. you know, we get through all those stuff. I don't think we ever got into natural immunity enough for people that had had it uh, enough. Yep. Um, I know that's something that the Ministry of Health continued to work on, but they never had incredible data on that stuff. Um, and like Sam said, there's a lot, as difficult as this has been, there's a lot of really good stuff that has come out of this too. The investments that we're making and stuff like that. J- just in my writing, we have, we're up to 500 new long-term care beds. We are, uh, 340 redeveloped. And in the 10 years previous to that, there was 78 new beds. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so the, what we're doing in order to improve those things, the training, um, the technology development you know, uh, touring different facilities and seeing different forms of infection control, um, are huge. And then just making sure that we have a sovereignty over some of that equipment is really, really good too. As far as the freedoms go and, and yeah, so some positive, some negative, some will feel like negatives. And, um, uh, yeah, I, there's a lot to learn and digest over this. How could we have done this better for sure? And we'll be, you know, if we manage to hang on in June, we'll be debating those things yet moving forward. And then what I fear is, as we've seen before, the lessons that were from SARS weren't learned mm, right. and all of our PPE was expired and, uh, and going back further. I wonder a lot of times, uh, going back cause I'm friends of the family, but, uh, in 1919, there was an election in the province of Ontario and all the established parties were thrown out on their ear and it was, uh, United farmers who became, um, the government. And, uh, okay. 1919, you just finished the first world war. You've been in a pandemic for a couple of years. I would have liked to go back and he died in 1961. Um, but, uh, Harry Nixon, who was premier briefly in 1943, um, what was the mood Mm. then? How similar was that to this? You know, um, what did it feel like in the 1950s when people were afraid of polio and it was illegal to go swimming in a, in a, in an open body of water period? Um, um, what was talked about in churches? Was there, you know, draconian measures and this isn't fair. And I don't know, but you know, I don't think we're reinventing the wheel. And, uh, and I am content to say that, uh, you know, we tried to keep as many people alive as possible imperfectly as we did with the, all the negative impacts that it's had and leave the freedoms in God's hands. And I trust that he will return them and, uh, and, and move forward. Well, thanks guys. Um, Lucas never lets these things go long. And I think we're over time. So we're definitely over here. That's a, that's a privilege. You (laughs) You guys are the first ones that (laughs) it's worth getting out there and, Appreciate you guys coming on. But there's again, two like, of us, you know, so that's, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. two politicians. We should have went three hours, so. <laughs> yeah. but uh, but then Will wouldn't be able to get through it in his car. But yeah. uh, no, appreciate your time and and uh, keep up the keep up the work, especially as Christians and in, in government. It's, uh, it's always a well, and the same thing for you guys. I mean, to think innovatively about different ways of reaching out to our youth and people and going outside of the norm. Um, and starting something like this, I think, is very very valuable. Do I agree with them all? We can have a long conversation <laughs> of reviewing all of the conver- you know, um, you know, theonomy, uh, Bitcoin, um, you know, working my way through Joe Boots' big book, 
mm-hmm. and um, and having those conversations, uh, I'd love to. But uh, just the fact that you have a couple of young folks who are trying to uh, impact in their own way and getting involved, um, that's awesome. Well done. Keep it up. Keep having the conversations and getting people here. Well, because it, it means a lot. And whether I agree with it or did, uh, don't necessarily agree with it, to be reaching out in different formats and doing that, I think is really, really critical. And, uh, and I really, really appreciate that. So well done boys. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I hope this was a service to people and that yeah. it would promote some, some understanding. Sam wants a point here still. Go ahead. Oh, never mind. Nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, uh, appreciate you guys taking the time to do this again. It takes a bit of courage to do that. You guys are under a lot of pressure and, uh, we appreciate your time. So if people have questions, send them in. I'm sure there may be a few. And uh, we look forward to addressing them in future episodes. So thanks thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Keep having real talk. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Real Talk. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen or watch the show. If you want to send us your feedback, and we'd love to hear it, please email us at reformedrealtalk at gmail.com. If you want to find us online or social media, we've got a lot of great content there. Just search Reformed Real Talk and we should come right up. This show is created and produced by myself, Lucas Holtfluer, and Tyler Vanderwood. And our wonderful podcast manager who does all the editing is Mariah Tamiga. So we're really thankful for her contribution to the show as well. That's all for now, folks. Thanks for watching or listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.